and greetings to all of you from Berkeley, California. Uh, I am very pleased uh, to be with you virtually today. Uh, and it's a pleasure and an honor to follow Mr. Kim's talk. Uh, and I want to build on something he said toward the end of his talk about the importance of keeping an open mind. And, and I want to build on that not only in quantum computing, but also in innovation more generally in business. So in the next 30 minutes, I want to discuss with you uh, the theory of open innovation and discuss how to get positive business results from it. To do this, I'm going to explore open innovation in the very recent pandemic that in many parts of the world, though not South Korea, uh, is still raging uh, and some of the responses that we have seen uh, to the crisis in the pandemic and how open innovation has played a role here. Uh, then I want to step back uh, and reflect on how we can be more productive with open innovation and get real results from it. So this is my agenda with you this morning. Let me briefly describe open innovation to you in 30 seconds. What you see here is the cover of a book I wrote back in 2003. Uh, and this, when I did a Google search on the term open innovation, I got back about 200 page links. And what had happened is the word open and the word innovation had appeared in the same sentence. But at that time, there was no real meaning to the term. In preparing for this talk, I did the same search using the same search term on the same search engine, and I got almost 900 million page links. So a lot has happened in the last 17 years. And when I go on LinkedIn, as I'll show you in a moment, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have open innovation as part of their profile. So what is open innovation? Uh, a brief definition would be a distributed innovation process involving flows of knowledge across organizational boundaries, both from the outside in and from the inside out. So this means that open innovation includes crowdsourcing, open source, collaboration with universities, and very importantly for our audience today, it also involves collaborations between larger firms and startup firms. All of these practices involve flows of knowledge across organizational boundaries. So here's uh, something I did last week, again, in preparation for being with you today. Uh, I went on LinkedIn, I searched on the term open innovation, and I looked at people in my network that were involved in open innovation. And of course, you can do the same search yourself and you might get somewhat different results, but I got 615,000 people. And this is just the first screen of those results. And look what showed up on the first screen of my results. Two people from different companies at Samsung who are both involved in open innovation. So this, I think, shows that open innovation is not only useful uh, in California, but in many parts of the world, including Korea. So let's talk now about what we are learning in the pandemic and the role that open innovation is playing in the pandemic. And as I think you'll see, there's been a real uh, positive bottoms up response to this crisis uh, led uh, not only by startup companies, but also by open innovation collaborations between startups and larger firms. So the three key steps I want to talk about, uh, and I will take them one at a time, are to stop the disease, uh, initiate the economic recovery, and then manage the reoccurrence of the virus. So in stopping the disease, uh, I'm drawing on a paper here I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested. Uh, 
the idea is to use open innovation to cope with the stress of an exponentially growing pandemic. And in a situation where a pandemic is transmitting very rapidly and growing exponentially, speed becomes absolutely critical. So when we think about innovation, we often think about performance, uh, as with quantum computing in the last talk. Sometimes we think also about cost, but in a pandemic, what you care most about is speed. And this is where open innovation can be very helpful. These inflows and outflows of knowledge across organizational boundaries, because with them, when, you when two parties come together to deal with this crisis, both can start in the middle. You can bring with you the results that you've already achieved, the knowledge you've already obtained, and then you build from there along with your collaborators. An example of this in pharmaceutical drug development is repurposing pharmaceutical compounds that were developed for one disease, but trying them in a different disease. And when you do that, the basic scientific information is already available. And in many cases, even the safety information of what happens when humans take the drug, much of this is already established. And so the remaining work can build from there. And indeed, most of the vaccine candidates that are under development right now for COVID-19 have this property of being repurposed from other indications. Another area where open innovation has already been playing a role in the pandemic has to do with accessing some of the surrounding technologies to limit the spread of the disease. And in particular, I'm focusing on personal protective equipment or PPE. Early on in the pandemic, masks were in short supply. So users started sharing their mask designs with one another and people started making their own masks, which reduced the competition for the N95 masks that were needed by the frontline health workers. Also uh, an example from the bottom up, uh, many people started sharing recipes for homemade hand sanitizers and perfume companies in France converted some of their manufacturing facilities to manufacture hand sanitizer, a different kind of repurposing. And then when we get to the hospitals, ventilators for patients uh, have been a scarce resource. And the response here has been very interesting. Uh, universities like MIT are posting designs for ventilators that you can build with a 3D printer. And manufacturers of hospital ventilators like Medtronic actually published their engineering drawings and gave permission for people to build these designs uh, without fear of being sued to try to disseminate uh, the availability of ventilators wherever they were really needed. All of this shows how open innovation can help deal with the pandemic. And startups have played a really important role here as well. Just in the last week, we've had very positive news about three of the candidates. And in these cases, two of the three are collaborations between startup companies and large pharmaceutical companies, while the third is between a pharma and Oxford University. So I'm showing you here Pfizer uh, and its vaccine that it's developed with BioNTech. Johnson & Johnson has also developed a vaccine with Moderna. And what you see here is in the old days, a vaccine was developed by a single company in its own laboratories. And the journey from the laboratory to the market took place all inside a single organization. Now with these vaccines and the race to get them as quickly as possible, the marathon of doing it all yourself from start to finish 
has been replaced with a relay race where the baton is passed from one runner to the next to complete the journey. Uh, and so startups have been a critical component of the vaccines that we're now beginning to see positive data on. So that's how we stop the disease and reduce the spread of the disease. But we know now that that's not enough. Uh, while we have to stop the disease, we must also think about the economy and we have to find ways and take actions now to start the recovery. This is again where open innovation can play a role, but it's a different role than before. Before it was bringing outside knowledge into the pharmaceutical companies, for example. Here to start the recovery economically, we need companies of all sizes to take some risk as Mr. Kim was saying in his last talk, uh, and to work together to bring internal knowledge to the outside for new businesses and new business models. With these probes, you can use the same amount of money to create more shots on goal. And so I'm using the football metaphor here to indicate the idea of being very experimental uh, and testing a lot of possibilities not putting a lot of investment in any one of them until you get some initial feedback from the marketplace. And the, this initial feedback, these weak signals are what will point the way forward uh, to find new opportunities to come out of and recover from the pandemic. Indeed, I think it's important to realize that as we wrestle with the pandemic, uh, we are not going to simply go back in time to the way things were a year ago. Some of these areas are not going to recover for quite a long time. That's the bad news. The good news for many of you is that there are new areas that are growing. And these new growth areas are where the recovery will take its start. And one area where we can already see this is in digital transformation, where people of all ages in the workforce have had to radically change the way they work. And we now have much more digital workflows and work processes. And so we have an opportunity to build on this. And indeed, to date, we have been forced to do this digital work with the tools that were already available. In the coming months, I expect that we'll see some new tools, tools that were built to support and extend the, the situation we're in now. And with better tools, it will become even more productive. Let me give you what might seem like an extreme example that shows how this tr digital transformation can help point the way forward. And to do this, I'm going to pick a rather extreme example, the airline industry, where uh, all airlines have been crushed by the pandemic and stock prices are way, way down. In, in one airline, I'm going to focus on more particularly Air Asia. They're based in Malaysia. Uh, they have lost 96% uh, of their fleet has been grounded and isn't flying, and their revenue in Q2 of this year fell by 98% from the year before. So the pandemic absolutely crushed AirAsia's business. And as you might expect, they've had to be brutal in cutting their operational expenses. And this is true of all airlines. All airlines have really suffered uh, in the pandemic. But with Air Asia, the story doesn't end there. Uh, there have been some initial activities that were started at Air Asia before the pandemic. And these activities have actually given Air Asia the opportunity to do some of these new probes, to search for some of the new businesses uh, that will help them recover after the pandemic. And I won't read all of these to you, but let me pick three that I think would be of interest uh, to this audience. 
Uh, they had earlier acquired Big Pay, a small fintech company that had a banking license. And they were using this to process some of the transactions for people who bought tickets uh, for flying on Air Asia. So it was a nice extension uh, to the company's business. And it captured a few more points of margin when people were buying the tickets. But in the aftermath of the pandemic, this has really expanded. Uh, and now uh, sending remittances from people in different parts of Asia and the Middle East have greatly increased uh, the flows here and have really expanded the business for Air Asia. So it's, it's one example of how the pandemic has really stimulated new opportunities. Uh, another one is what began as their in-flight duty-free shop that every airline has. Uh, Air Asia in the pandemic converted this into a platform for third-party merchants uh, to put their merchandise uh, on these sites and to host these third-party merchants and become their digital ally to continue to sell things as people stopped going to stores in person and more and more buying was happening online, Air Asia repurposed our shop to become a platform to enable many third-party merchants to provide their merchandise to these customers. So it too has really grown. Uh, and then the last one is a venture arm that they established before the pandemic. In the pandemic, they've realized that the startups uh, that they've been supporting are not simply hurting for funding and for business, but they need a lot of coaching. They need a lot of other services, particularly during these hard times. So they have extended their services to these startups to help. So all of these were in place before the pandemic, but they are all responding very strongly uh, in response to the pandemic. Uh, and indeed in the uh, financial results that AirAsia reported this September, uh, their digital revenue, the, the overall business as you know, has really been negatively impacted, but the digital business is going up very strongly. It more than doubled in Q2, which in turn was more than double what it was in Q1. So just in those six months, the digital revenues grew by 500%. So when your overall revenues are collapsing, uh, it's great to have some signs of hope for the future in these digital revenues. Then the third part of what the pandemic is teaching us is to be prepared for a reoccurrence of the virus. Uh, and here, the, the key message is to have an infrastructure in place, whether you're a country like South Korea or a company like Air Asia or Samsung, you need a healthy infrastructure to be ready for the resurgence. Uh, and one thing that I think the digital uh, transformation is calling a bright light on is the need to reduce internal organizational silos. Many companies have departments that share knowledge within the department, but do not share knowledge well at all across departments. And this has always been a problem, but in this digital world, it becomes a real problem. And this is where I think a lot of work and a lot of attention uh, can really make a difference. And don't limit this to the internal silos in your own organization. Think about your ecosystem, the partners, the suppliers, the customers that you have. How can you engage more with them? Uh, and for many of the larger companies in the audience, I would say cultivate those startups, especially now, uh, because they're hungry, they're motivated. Uh, they will work quickly, they will work hard, this makes them excellent collaboration partners. And to the startups, I say, yes, there are risks in working with large companies, but if you want to survive and if you want to grow, you will have to find ways to work with these companies because they can help you scale. 
they can help you grow. If you choose wisely the companies you work with, and then if you do a, a good job of collaborating with them. So the startups and the larger companies need each other. Uh, and open innovation is a way to think about how to harmonize that collaboration. So that's what we're going to do in light of the pandemic. And I hope you see how some of the open innovation practices relate to each of those. Now I'm going to take a step back uh, and make another argument. Uh, Mr. Kim in the previous talk uh, mentioned Moore's Law and how prominent it has been during the entire information age. And this is a good example of how the pace of technology has been accelerating. So not only is technology improving, it's improving at an increasing rate. Uh, and another piece of evidence that is often cited is the lifespan of Fortune 500 companies. The number of years they spend on the Fortune 500 list is getting shorter and shorter. A uh, hundred years ago, a company would be on the list for uh, 80 or 90 years. Now the lifespan has shortened to 14 years. And one of the reasons for this is the accelerating pace of technology and the disruption that comes with that. So all of this suggests that we should be in a world of abundance because knowledge and technology are growing. In fact, they're accelerating. Uh, and this creates a world where we, all of us have access to wonderful things that our parents and grandparents could only dream of. But that story is not complete. And if we look at the economic side of the picture, and if we look at people's wages, if we look at people's daily lives, uh, we find something that's quite jarring. And that is that productivity growth is actually not increasing. It's not accelerating. To the contrary, it's actually slowing down. And this is not unique to one country. This is true of productivity growth across all of the 40 OECD countries. And wage growth is even more stagnant than productivity growth. Here's what I'm talking about. Going back a long time to the 1940s, uh, you can see here total business factor productivity uh, and you can see the trend line uh, relative to the actual performance. And starting in the 1970s, uh, there was a, graph, a, a gap that emerged between the trend line and the actual performance. So this is exactly the opposite of what we would expect with exponential technologies and Moore's law. We would expect, if anything, the productivity growth would go above the trend line. And that's where we're not seeing that. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this is not one country's story. Across the G7 countries you see here, going back to the 1950s, this downward trend exists in all of these countries. So again, it's not a, a story of one particular nation. It's a story of many countries experiencing the slowdown in productivity growth. So what's going on here? The, the answers do vary by country and my apologies for sharing the US information with you. Uh, frankly, South Korea does better on this next measure that I'm sharing, uh, but the amount of investment uh, that is being made in basic research, uh, here I'm showing you federal research and development has been trending down quite a bit since the early 1960s. So we're not generating the basic scientific infrastructure the way that we used to. And so uh, one way you could interpret this is we are living off of the investments we made decades ago. And trends like Moore's law depend on maintaining a, a strong science and technology base. If we fail to do that, sooner or later, uh, the Moore's Law trends are going to start to slow down. Another thing that's happening, uh, and this is uh, value added per worker showing the labor productivity, 
is if we compare the very best firms and their productivity growth to the average firm, uh, we see another gap growing. And my interpretation here is that the very best firms are taking advantage of Moore's law and they are taking advantage of exponential technologies uh, like AI, like quantum computing, uh, like big data. But the average firm really is not. Uh, so to think about artificial intelligence for a minute, we know that you need a lot of data and you need it properly structured to be able to do the analyses that you need to train an algorithm. And the very best firms are doing exactly this and often getting very good results. But many companies don't have enough data to train such an algorithm. Other companies have some of the data, but they don't have it organized in a way that it's suitable to be analyzed for this training. So this is an example of how the best are really separating themselves from the rest of the firms. And so when we look at overall economic productivity, we're not simply looking at the very best firms, we're looking at the average firms, because those are the ones that are across the whole society. So that's what I think is going on uh, at the societal level. But if we go inside organizations, they too have to think about innovation and an innovation infrastructure. And there are three facets that they need to attend to. We begin with the generation of new ideas and new innovation. And this is something that frankly, startups are really good at, but there are some very bright and creative people in SMEs and larger companies too. So we have to generate new ideas to, to start the innovation process, but that's not enough. We have two other areas that we have to give attention to before we're gonna get results. The second thing we have to attend to is the dissemination, the spread of this innovation. We have to spread it within our company through those organizational silos. And we also have to get it out of the company into our partners, our distribution channels, our third party support organizations, our customers and suppliers. So the dissemination is a really critical step before we see any impact from these new ideas. And then when we successfully sell these to our customers, the customers have to be able to absorb these and put them to work and get real value, real results from this before they're going to be ready to buy more and come back and buy again. And so all three of these facets have to be managed in order to get the results that you wanna see from innovation. It saddens me to say this next slide, but I think in the last financial crisis we had in 2007, 2008, uh, open innovation itself was quite new. Uh, the book had only been out a couple, three years. Uh, and I'm afraid to say that some organizations used the language of open innovation to basically outsource their internal R&D activities. And in the short term, this reduced the expenses and probably helped the short term financial results. But in the longer term, I'm positive that it damaged their in innovation infrastructure so that when markets came back and when growth resumed, they were less able to innovate. Uh, here's an example of what I'm thinking about. Uh, if you think about an innovation process beginning at the left, flowing through to the right, uh, in the intake in the innovation process, uh, open innovation has done a lot to greatly expand the intake, uh, whether it's crowds or universities or startups or intermediaries, suppliers, customers, there are just many sources of possible innovation ideas. Then we evaluate these ideas uh, and work on them. And we try to create proofs of concept or POCs. And these are prototypes that we bring to our business units internally 
And it's often a good practice to share these with a few customers externally to get their feedback. And with positive feedback, the business units take them and scale them up again. The problem comes if you have all this stuff coming into the process, but you have not sustained your internal innovation infrastructure, uh, you can overwhelm the system and create congestion instead of creating more innovation. And this is particularly the case in many of the support functions that support the innovation process. In this, the, this process I'm showing here, someone has to evaluate all these external ideas. There are a lot of legal issues that have to be managed. There are personnel issues that have to be addressed with HR. There's always the question of money. The purchasing organization has an important role to play. So these are things that have to be expanded and supported to embrace open innovation and get real results. Without that support, without that infrastructure, you won't get the results that you want. So now I'm coming to the end of my talk. Uh, to get better business results from open innovation, you need to address all three of these facets. In the generation phase, uh, there are many things to attend to, but particularly embrace and leverage startup organizations because they are wonderful laboratories uh, for testing quickly a lot of very new thinking without being constrained by legacy uh, business issues. On the dissemination part, it's very important to share and be open and reduce the friction of getting knowledge to move. It's often a good idea, in fact, to move people to help move the knowledge to where it needs to be. And when it comes to the absorption, I've already emphasized a number of times in my talk to you the value of collaborating between larger companies and startup companies. But there's a very important problem that has to be addressed. And that is that many times large companies take too long to make decisions. And so you need to find processes that can work at the pace of startups and give them the decisions they need in the time that they need in order to really get the value of the collaboration. And in some cases, the startup might help you find a new business model uh, for ideas that are inside that don't have a path forward currently. So all of these things are what can help get better business results from open innovation. I appreciate very much your, your time and your attention. Uh, I do write lots of books. Uh, I show you my email address here, uh, and I would be very happy to discuss any of this further with you and answer questions you may have. Come sami down.